welcome to Community Group. We are so glad that you are here tonight. My name is Taylor. And I'm Josh. And we got something going a little different tonight. We have actually a pre-recorded video. And part of the reason we're doing that is so that us as campus youth pastors can be available and spending time with you guys on Wednesday night. Because it's so important to us. So we got a couple events happening. We just want to tell you guys what's going on over the next week and a bit and into February as well. We have an event coming up this Friday. This Friday. It's a campus specific event. And if you don't have your ticket yet, make sure you get it. Go on the website, go under the campus you attend and get yourself a ticket. Absolutely. Also next Wednesday, we have Fam Night. If you don't know what you're doing, make sure that you connect with your community group leader. We're also, we're also gonna be talking about a little bit of something you could potentially be doing next Wednesday as well today. And so it's gonna be fun. Yeah. And if you have never been to the Big Splash. Big Splash. We got the Big Splash coming up February 17th and 18th. Make sure you get your ticket. It's don't gonna miss be it. awesome. We sell out pretty quick, but this is one you don't wanna miss. 100%. Well, let's pray and let's jump into it today. Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you for each and every one of uh, the students and the leaders that are here tonight. We just ask that uh, you would be with us, that you would be with the groups uh, as we uh, uh, just proclaim this message today. And so Lord, we just ask that uh, each person would grow and they become uh, greater, better, stronger followers of you. In your amazing name, amen. Last week, we talked about Gideon and how he was able to lean into what God had for him because he embraced his God-given identity. And he learned that God was for him and that you and I can do that too. Yeah, we also learned that the Israelites would go through this cycle of disobedience that would lead to discipline, and then they would experience, they would, they would repent and have this time of repentance, and then they would experience God's blessing. And the Israelites would go through that cycle over and over and over again. In fact, we can go through that cycle to ourselves, right? And the thing is, it just looks a little bit different because of Jesus' death on the cross. Like we no longer receive the immediate discipline that the Israelites might have experienced. But something just a little bit different happens. You see, God is so perfect, he can't even look at sin. So when we willingly sin, it creates this space between us and God. And this doesn't mean we lose our relationship with him, but it creates a tension between God and us. And this is where the devil takes his opportunity to wreak havoc on our lives by stealing, killing, and destroying, as John 10 talks about. But when we repent, which is the act of asking for forgiveness from God and working towards turning away from that sin, we start to see God's hand of blessing in our life. This is why it just feels so good to get it right with God. This doesn't mean that bad things only happen when we're not living the way we should. We live in a broken world with broken people and sometimes really bad things happen to really good people for no reason. We're going to be talking a bit more about pain and suffering in a few months, but right now we're gonna take a little closer look at Joshua's story. Every year when I was in elementary school, teachers made us, teachers made us go through this grueling task. Mm. Now, what we had to do is we had to write and present speeches. I don't know if you guys still do this in, in, in school, but these were brutal. Not only would we cut gym class short to allow more time to write, but I had to stand up in front of the class and speak for seven to 10 minutes on a random topic that I thought at one point would be interesting. It turned out I wasn't interested in it, in it at all. Now, unfortunately, halfway through me actually presenting, I found myself rocking back and forth <laughs> at the front so much that my classmates would tell me that I was making them nauseous and seasick. <laughs> and it was then, at that moment, that I realized I hate public speaking, which is actually kind of really funny considering this is what I do for my job now. But I wasn't the only person that felt that way. Uh, almost every single one of the 30 plus students felt the same way, except for maybe that one person who really, really loved this. Now, not one of those speeches made a lasting impact on my life or on me, but there have been some speeches that have actually lasted the test of time. So uh, let's take a moment in our groups and just begin to ask this question. What are some speeches that you know of that have made a lasting impact? And why don't you turn to the person beside you and kind of discuss it for a moment.
A few speeches that made a lasting impact that come to mind are JFK's inaugural address. My fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And then Winston Churchill also gave this epic speech on the British Parliament during World War II. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Yeah, and probably the most famous speech that was delivered at the height of the civil rights movement came from Martin Luther King Jr. He said this, he said, even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It's a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Now, you know what's interesting about the majority of these uh, world famous speeches is that they came at a point of tension. John F. Kennedy was speaking to a divided America. Winston Churchill was uh, speaking during World War II and Martin Luther King was speaking during the peak of the racial injustice. You know, a man named Joshua in the Bible has a very similar well-known address. This isn't young Joshua who marched around the walls of Jericho. This is old man Joshua who knows his time is limited and it's as if he can see into the future and the cycles the nation of Israel will fall into time and time again that are just going to cause them pain. And he says these famous words in Joshua 24 verses 14 and 15. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, or will it be the gods of the Amorites in, in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Yeah, and at first glance, this is a very weird scripture. I mean, Joshua is essentially saying, hey, serve God, but if you don't want to, then choose another God that you want to serve. But we've got to remember that these people saw the miracles that their God performed. They saw how their God was far superior to any other God and that no God actually measured up to him. You know, I would say it's like if you were to take, were offered, sorry, a pair of used dollar store headphones, or a pair of brand new AirPod Pros? There's a pretty obvious answer to that. And no, it's not the dollar store headphones. But this analogy doesn't do justice to how much more incredible and powerful the Lord was and is in comparison to any other God. Yeah, so old man Joshua is seeing the challenges that the Israelites are gonna face if they don't follow God. And he's saying, choose this day who you will serve. But this isn't a one day decision. It's an everyday decision. This was true for the Israelites back then and it's also true for us today. We need to make a decision daily of who we will serve. What Satan will try to do is he's gonna try to mess you up because he wants you to choose that second rate headphones so that you will have a second rate life where he's gonna kill, steal and destroy. And that's what he did with Adam and Eve. And, and that's what we, we've been seeing he's been doing ever since then. So let's show you how he does this. And while we do this, we're going to get to learn a little bit of Hebrew in the process. There are different names for God based on how God decided to reveal himself to people in some of their greatest needs, which is why we know God as our healer, our deliverer, our provider, for example. Yeah. So now when God created the world, he revealed to himself as creator, and which is the Hebrew name for Elohim. This is what it says in Genesis chapter one. It says, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Then God, Elohim, said, let there be light, and there was light. All the way throughout Genesis one, when God is creating, God uses the name Elohim. But when God creates mankind, he switches things up. Yeah, we're introduced to the word Yahweh. In fact, whenever you're going through your Bible and you see the word LORD in all capitals, it's the Hebrew name of Yahweh. 
This word means master and absolute ruler. God uses this through all of Genesis 2 with the creation of mankind. It says this, uh, Then the Lord, Yahweh, God, Elohim, or the Lord God, create a form man of dust from the ground and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Hmm. See, God was saying he's not just the creator, but that he is the absolute ruler over all mankind. And when we look at chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Did you just see that? See, what Satan did is he subtly but effectively twisted God's name. See, what he did is he removed the lordship of God and he said, Did God? God really say? And in doing so, he reduced the authority of God in Adam and Eve's life. Satan kept the concept of religion, but he removed God's authority over, over their life, and they bought it. This is what Satan did back then, and this is what he did to the Israelites. And guess what? This is what he wants to do in your life, too. So old man Joshua tells the Israelites, look at what our ruler, our God, did. And Joshua reminds Israel of their history with God, how God saved them from the famine and brought them into Egypt with Joseph, how Moses led them out of Egypt and through the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army hot on their trail. The Israelites might not have been alive to experience all of this, but this is their history. Then he says, you might not want to serve Yahweh, but you need to choose today who you will serve. Then Joshua says, me and my house we're going to serve the master, the ruler, Yahweh, the Lord. And we can see that Satan's goal has always been destruction. The way Satan wants to destroy your life is to reduce the priority of God in your life, just like he did with Adam and Eve. Today is the destruction of your relationships, the destruction of your self-esteem, maybe your understanding of God and, and his truth. But in contrast, we've seen time and time again that God's goal and his purpose for his people is always good. God is a rescuer. He is a helper, a healer, and a friend. We have, he has good plans for his people. And we can trust that his plans are way better than our own because he sees the whole picture and knows the best way to bring things together for our good and for his glory. And when it gets hard to trust him, or forget that his way is better, Joshua reminds us to look back, look at our own story, the stories of people around you, the stories of people around you, and see all the times that God has been faithful and he's worked things out for the good of those who trust and love him. Listen, tonight as you're watching this, you might not remember your history, but this is a really good starting point. A.W. Tozer once said, Anything God has ever done, He can do now. Anything God has ever done anywhere, He can do here. Anything God has ever done for anyone, He can do for you. You may not know your history, but everything God was back in Scripture, He can be for you. Now, He can be your healer your provider, deliverer, comforter, savior, counselor, hope, peace, and so much more. The story of scripture, the story of the first century believers, the second century believers, all the way to now, that is your history. So we'll say this today, as Joshua said so many years ago, choose this day who you will serve. But I am gonna serve the Lord. Now here's the question. How do we do this? Well, we serve God with our heads. We serve God with our hearts. We serve God with our hands. Serving God with our heads or our minds requires us to be aware that everything is competing for space in our lives. Yeah. Studying for school, binge watching whatever your favorite show is right now, keeping up with TikTok, Insta, Be Real, and anything else that you might be going on in your life. While some of these are great, like studying for school, and others can be really good in moderation if it's honoring to God, 
but sometimes we can fill up our minds with things that aren't so good. Yeah, this is what the Apostle Paul said. He said, fix your eye, your thoughts on what is true, and honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So how do we choose God with our heads? Well, I think we need to begin to create a filter in our minds with, with this, right? We can ask the question, is this true? Is this honorable? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it admirable, excellent, or worthy of praise? Well, if it is, then we put our minds to it. Practically, what does this look like? It could mean turning something off. For example, you could have a too fast forward rule for TV shows and movies before you turn it off. That means if you have to fast forward any scenes more than once, they don't fall into the categories of true, honorable, pure, etc. Turn it off. That's your way of serving God with your mind. The same principles can apply to the people you may follow on social media. You may need to unfollow some people because what they post isn't honorable or admirable. Or maybe it means you need to delete that app altogether. So number one, choose God with our heads. Yeah, and second, we can choose to serve God with our hearts. We know that from Matthew, it says that from the overflow of our hearts that our mouth speaks. And in Psalms, it says that I've hidden God's word in my heart that I might not sin against him. Now, I'm sure that some, if not all of us, have been given an assignment at least once that we uh, didn't look at the instructions and we started doing the entire thing wrong or you did the entire assignment wrong and I got it handed back to you because you completely messed it up. It's true. I definitely have done that a time or two before. <laughs> Sounds like Ikea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You see, this is the same as our relationship with God. The easiest way for us to sin against God is not to have his word in our hearts. Now, you might be like, dude, I'm so busy. I got no time. I barely have time to get my essentials done. Well, we're going to try and make this easy for you by bringing back something we talked about at our senior high retreat this past spring. The first 15. 15 minutes three activities just as you wake up in the morning. Yeah, so the first thing that you'll do is you'll read your Bible for five minutes. It's about one chapter. Or if you need to, you can put on the audio Bible as well. It's too easy. The second thing is you put on a worship song. And you can do this while maybe you're getting ready in the bathroom as well. The third thing is that we'll reflect on what you read or listened to and spend some time uh, just in prayer about it. Just connecting with God about some of the things that we read and that we listened to in worship. You know, at this point, you've probably spent 15 minutes with the Lord. And as you are getting ready for that day, you've also cho chosen to put God in your heart. You've chosen to spend time with him and you're putting his word deep in there. So number one, choose God with your head. Number two, choose God with your heart. Yeah, and the last part is our hands. What do we do? Right? See, we can watch uh, what we consume, we can hide God's word in our heart, but if nothing else happens in our lives, if we don't take action to put into practice what we've learned through God's word, then we've almost made it. We haven't gotten the whole way. We're missing a big piece of what it means to commit to following the Lord. There's two parts to this. The first is that outside, the outside has to match the inside. How I treat others should be influenced by the word of God that is hidden in my heart. And the second part goes beyond just treating people like God asks us, but we're actually meant to take a step further by being intentional or proactive about helping and loving and serving others around us. Not out of obligation, but because God's word has gotten in and it's changed our hearts. Mm -hmm. Someone may say something along the lines of what James chapter 2 says. You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? James is saying that our faith must go past how we think to how we treat other people. That's how we serve other people well. This means that 
how I interact with the person who might be a little bit different than I am or who uh, maybe they might sit alone, uh, the person who might be loud and obnoxious, how I interact with a person who might have hurt one of my really close friends, or even how I treat those who are close to me like a best friend or a sibling. Right? Treating these people well is how you choose today who you will serve. In fact, you know, next week we have an opportunity at Fam Night. And a part of your job tonight is to work with your community group leaders and to figure out if there's an opportunity for you to serve somewhere, somehow, either this month or next. And we want you to just spend that time choosing today, tomorrow, the next day, and on who you will serve. And you do that with your head, with your heart, and with your hands. In your communion groups, we have stickers that look like this. And they are all gonna say, choose this day. We encourage you to take them and place them somewhere that you'll see them and be reminded throughout the day that you choose to serve God. Yeah, so here are some quick questions for you to consider. One, who are you choosing to commit to follow? Number two, how does your life practically reflect that today? How can it reflect that later on? Let's take a moment to ask God what he's saying to him us about all of this and ask him what he wants us to do about it. Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together. And the challenge that uh, it is to choose today who will serve with our head, with our hearts, and with our hands, especially in this day. And Lord, in, as we go home to our families, as we uh, go to school and hang out with our friends and as some of us have some hard conversations or maybe some easy conversations that it would be evident that we are choosing you first to each person that's in our lives in your amazing name amen thanks guys for being with us today and to spending time listening to what God is saying respond and choose this day we want to remind you of a couple of announcements again coming up. This Friday, we got our uh, campus-specific events. So if you don't have your ticket yet, make sure you go on our website, find your campus location, get yourself a ticket. It's going to be great. Absolutely. Also, uh, next Wednesday, we have Fam Night. Remember, we just kind of talked about it. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, uh, think about a serve event, uh, maybe this month or potentially next month, or at least in the next couple of months, try to do a serve event with your community group. Yeah. And the last one we want to tell you again, big exciting uh, event happening is the Big Splash, February 17th, 18th. Please join us. We would love for you to get your tickets early uh, and be there for the whole weekend. Absolutely. Listen, we love you guys. Believe in you. See you.